Hi, everyone. Welcome to Web Wednesday. Today, my guest is Dustin, and he's going to talk to us about WebAssembly and how he created a browse desktop on browser. Hi, Dustin. Welcome hey. To how are Thanks. you today? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be on here and uh, show you my desktop environment in the browser and chat about WebAssembly. No, we are excited to have you. I know uh, very little about WebAssembly, and um, your project seems to got really good attention at Hacker News. Everybody was raving about it, so I can't wait to see. Um, but first, can you tell us what you do at Microsoft and introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm a software engineer level two working at uh, Inviva Insights, uh, primarily working on the front end right now, doing like uh, transitioning to kind of like everyone's doing in the web right now. We're always modernizing and transitioning more things to React. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now, React and Redux. And uh, okay. was doing it at that in my previous company as well. I have to ask, what was it before? React. Uh, I think it was. I think it might have been Angular, or, or it might have even been React. To be honest, I haven't even tried to dig into the code too much. I've just tried to focus on the new stuff, I guess. But uh, I think it was React, but like React done poorly. So we're trying to do it better this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it is interesting. There's always uh, next time. Um, mm -hmm. Well, there was a big transition. Sorry, sorry. Could you repeat? Can you tell us what the product is also? Uh, yeah. It's well. It's insights is a big project uh, or product in general that has a lot of things going on. It has teams, it has different things in the web, but it's uh, it's kind of just getting different information about, I mean, my, my thing specifically is for the employees, let's say. We actually can, I think it used to be used internally in Microsoft to kind of give you suggestions about, hey, for today, uh, I see that you have these scheduled, maybe you want to talk to this person or you had this conversation. I, I see insights about your day or I try to, kind of like a smart assistant, I guess, and, and I'm working on an interface there that's kind of uh, helping analysts uh, make our lives better by doing something with that data, basically. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some AI going on there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is, but I, I'm, out, I'm not in that part of it at the moment. Cool. Um, can you show us what you are going to sh um, show? What is your demo today? Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I can show it here. So this is my, my website, dustinbrett.com. And this is uh, the thing I had on Hacker News. It's my uh, desktop environment in the browser. Uh, it's kind of modeled in, in some ways over Windows 10, just because that's what I use as well. And it's got uh, many different apps, a lot of them which I've used, uh, utilized WebAssembly. Uh, I can even show the GitHub project, I guess, quickly here, just to show you that uh, uh, I got it on GitHub here as well. There it is. And yeah, it's it's doing quite popular on GitHub as, as well. And it, you can see here kind of listed all the different features it has. Uh, many different apps, such as uh, for running executables, running uh, x86 emulation. If you go into the Go files here and look at the .wasm files, which is, is the WebAssembly files that kind of do the magic, you can see that I'm utilizing quite a diff few different libraries that I could uh, show you just because there's there's been so many things ported uh, to the web now. And I would say my, my view on WebAssembly is more of a, from the utilization point of view at the moment. Uh, I haven't done as much uh, con contributing to the, the porting side of things, but that's yeah. another big interest is actually taking apps that are on the desktop or not meant for the web and essentially porting them through WebAssembly to be able to run uh, in the browser, basically. Mm. That sounds great. Um, hi, everyone who's jo just joining. Tell us where you're joining from. And if you have any questions, please Put it on the chat and uh, we'll get to them soon. If you want, I could demo a few of these WebAssembly things then. Yes, please. Sure. So well, I can just drag in some examples here. Let's say I have an ISO here that was on my desktop. And if I were to double double click that, you can open it. But uh, if we open it here in virtual x86, this is an open source project that does x86 emulation. And as you see here, this can run uh, as if it's running on a, on a machine, basically. You could burn this ISO and boot it onto your computer as well. And this can be used to do other things. Uh, I have some other examples here in the disk images here. There's another operating system called Calibri or even Linux. Let's say you want to run Linux on, in the browser. You can do that as well with this uh, x86 emulation. And that can be used for more advanced things like the Calibri one is actually a graphical user interface. So you can have a full on uh, graphical user interface. And there's even some people that have gotten this running like Windows 95, that kind of thing, which can always be fun. I haven't gotten that far with it yet because it's a, it's a little resource intensive. But these, these little examples here can be great for at least for demonstrating what x86 can do. And this actually even has network support uh, and you can kind of go in and then you can just use it like a, a full operating system really and you could drag it around here and this is a uh, being generating a, a canvas element essentially so WebAssembly the magic that it does is it kind of is in the background doing everything and just giving you a picture and saying give me a canvas and I'll draw a picture for you of 
of what you want the app to do, basically, in this case, x86 emulation. So that's the power of WebAssembly, and that's why I've been using it, is there's there's so many use cases like this. Let's say another one here for, you see here, I got Doom on here, is that there's actually a DOS emulator, which is similar to x86 emulation, but this one's been optimized for DOS. And again, you can run any kind of DOS game on here, such as the shareware version of Doom. Uh, and it'll inter you can interact with it like a, like any normal website, but it's running code that essentially was made for in this case DOS. Wow, that is uh, really impressive. I never seen um, uh, Canvas being used this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is new to me. Um, so why why did you decide to build this app to start with? Right. Well, I, I've always had an interest in making like a really crazy personal site, I guess. Uh, this has been something since like 1998, I think, uh, I was working on this idea when I was a kid. Uh, it was kind of got me, sparked my interest in it. it was when I got into HTML and JavaScript and learned about right-clicking and view source on web pages and that you could, you could see people's source code. Uh, and I've just kept taking that to the limit as far as what can be put in a browser, what can I... What can someone do when they when they go to dustinbrett.com? How many things can I show a person essentially where they go, oh wow, I didn't know you could do that, kind of thing. So that was the original uh, inspiration for it, I guess. And then w once I realized just how powerful WebAssembly had got and how much support it has in browsers now, that's when I really realized that uh, a lot of my apps are going to have to are going to rely on WebAssembly, and that's going to be the the wow factor in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it is impressive for for us. Can you just explain what WebAssembly is? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess I'm not a WebAssembly expert. I should probably say that right off the top. So I, I'll give you my my version of, of what I, how I use WebAssembly and what I consider it is. It's essentially, it's it is like a it's a type of would I say language? I guess let's say it's a build target. Let's say you could have a language. Let's say Rust or Go or various different programming languages that you can build into WebAssembly now, and you could take that and with a little bit of massaging, typically, you can convert that into a different format, essentially. Like if everyone's familiar with Windows, you have like a .exe file or something, and that's essentially a, a program. Let's say, um, I'm trying to think of some good ones here that are, are just like a standalone program anyways, .exe. And, and this makes a .wasm file, but essentially it's the same idea where you can just run it in the browser, but but you have to do a lot more manual work to actually get it to show the way you want. And that's where, once I realized WebAssembly had that power to essentially take an EXE and put it in the browser, then it was just a matter of, of what are the logistics to to make it very interactive and so that the user doesn't have to notice all those little steps in between. We have a new joiner and asking what this, what this is. Uh, <laughs> Justin here created a, a, a desktop uh, application on the browser and with WebAssembly and explaining us what he did and why he did it. Yeah, and I just had various different demos of uh, where I've used WebAssembly. It's kind of littered all throughout the, the web, the page here in different apps. Uh, let's say, for example, this file here is a .7-zip file uh, via lib, LibArchive has been ported. Uh, that was like a, a, tip, a library that you could build in Linux, let's say, or make a, a .exe file for. That's been ported to WebAssembly, so I can do something with the .7-zip file. I can actually extract it, and it can actually... Now, it's doing this in the background there. I don't have a... The way it works, it's a little hard at the moment to get a loading screen, but it, one thing, one step at a time. Anyways, it extracted the files, so you're able to take a, a .7z file and extract it, which is something on a typical base Windows installation you wouldn't be able to do that. But if you went to my website, drag on a .7z file, you could. And that was another interesting use case I thought was just the ability for people to to do things without having to install these uh, add-on programs, kind of. That's great. I'm surprised you're not working for the Windows. Um, <laughs> you can say. Well, maybe one day, maybe win Windows 15 or something, you know, I, I'm I'm in no hurry or anything. Exactly. Uh, you're here for the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, this is so interesting that it started way, way back. Uh, how did it start? It? Was it just plain HTML website at some point? Yeah, definitely. I have. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore. I have it on the Internet Archive. Uh, it's like surf.2 slash misc, I think, mm -hmm. from 1999 when I was, I think, eight or nine years old. And that, even at that point, I knew I wanted a miscellaneous website. And, and I, even for, for a nine-year-old, I built a few things. Like I had like a little alien screensaver that I'd doing like a Adobe Macromedia tool or something. But I was already learning just the idea of I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show stuff. I wanted to share. And uh, yeah, and I guess there's something to making a website where you say the website's about this and then you put yourself in a box. So that's why I guess with this desktop environment, the website is about, it's almost about everything. It's an entire system. So uh, at any point, as far as the side project, it's been very enjoyable because at any point I can kind of just jump in and say, I want to I wanna try to make this kind of app or I want to add this kind of feature. And, and it, it just can be a rabbit hole that, uh, that can be fun to kind of dive into. What is your current rabbit hole? 
Um, it's actually this right here. If you see this icon right here, I actually found a way to get the .exe files. I read them and actually extract the icon, create an icon file, and use that as the thumbnail. That, that took a while to actually figure out the code for that. Like you have to destruct these window.pe files and then look in the resources, get the icon PNG data. I had to rebuild the icon header uh, all the, and then send it to get created as a thumbnail. So, so it's actually an executable, and before that, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't have an icon, but now it's kind of a seamless look where it, where it's like that. If I drag it over here, it'll have to recreate it. It created it so fast, it only was a little flash of the the generic icon. But that was just a little fun rabbit hole, and that case doesn't use WebAssembly, but but a lot of cases have. Hmm. Um, we have a question actually. Sure. Uh, how resource hungry WASM programs are? Right. Um, well, I mean, obviously it depends, but I would say. Typically, the, the programs you're using, um, typically you're, you're bringing things on there to do resource, resource intensive things, I would say also. So that's one thing. If you, um, in some ways, it's much more optimal, like depending on what thing you want to do, it can be, there can be very good use cases if you have some kind of logic in JavaScript to move it over to WebAssembly. And in that way, it'll be, um, I mean, it'll probably use your resources more, but it, because it's faster, because it's more efficient. Uh, but if let's say something like at the x86 emulator, that, that is quite resource intensive. Unfortunately, I don't have something quite as, as something like a task manager to open. I mean, I guess I do if I shared another screen. But th there isn't qu quite as much information on the browser other than to say that like, hey, this tab is taking a lot of memory. Uh, and just the general feel of, uh, of the main thread, that kind of thing. It, and that's another thing, too, that, that gets into the concept of, of these, uh, the threads of the browser. If you go into the dev tools under sources here, you can actually see these uh, threads mentioned here that are different WebAssembly threads. So, dep or, no, sorry, not WebAssembly threads, um, just threads in the browser. Uh, in some cases are running WebAssembly apps, in some cases not. So let's say this GIF worker here. I, don't think this GIF worker is, but some of the WebAssembly apps I have are, will actually create their own threads that are run off of the main thread, so they mm -hmm. they basically hurt the resources less. Let's say for this animated wallpaper, before that was on its own thread, if I opened something like that x86 emulator, it would just be uh, 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 like nothing worked, basically. So um, it is resource intensive, but it's a matter of balancing the resources, and it depends how the WebAssembly package has been made. Which, which gets into a whole other bag of worms about these WebAssembly libraries where it's not just a .wasm file. There's also a whole JavaScript side of it typically to, to do the communication of the interactions because the WebAssembly itself can't interact with the DOM, with the, the, like the canvas element. So even something as simple as doing those clicks for x86, there is a little bit of JavaScript in between that has to take that and send it over to WebAssembly so that it can kind of work with it. That's amazing. Um, you have a very good point. Like we don't... Uh have a continuous uh, measurement in the browser in our developer console, right? Right. I mean, there is some. I don't want to. I don't want to be too harsh. There is an entire performance system here, but but it's hard to get something like equivalent to a task manager and to really break it down at at that level. I mean, th there might be, but I guess I'm not. Perhaps I'm just not that advanced. To be honest, is another part of it. Yeah, and from uh, UK, I think you can use uh, Tom's Plus to grab the icon file. It can use the logo file too. Cool. Thumbs plus. Yeah. I'm not sure. Like the, the logistics of it, I guess. Uh, and, and I guess to get to the point of the, this app as well is that everything is running client side as well. So this is uh, so when you put that exe in, it's using the file system API to grab it off your computer, put it into binary format in, in your browser in IndexedDB database. And then it actually is reading that and interpreting the header, creating the image file. So, so, and I mean, I don't know about Thumbs Plus, but it, it could be cool. I've definitely spent a lot of time tackling it. And that's that's another fun part of these little rabbit holes is when you, you start going into GitHub and you find these projects from eight years ago where somebody kind of solved something but didn't have this kind of use case for it. And I've just been adding those things when I find them. That is amazing. It sounds like you're spending a lot of time on this. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> too much, yeah. <laughs> well, it's working. Can you use your D for Linux or make Linux this Um Well, you definitely, I have definitely considered the idea of uh, distributions and having something almost like a, a Chrome OS style. It, it would probably have to be something where it's bootstrapped with Linux and then it kind of just boots into a full screen browser. That's, that's one idea I've considered. Oh, here, it didn't do great with the resolution. Uh, still always finding bugs too, which is always a fun thing. But I can always just clear it and reset it here. So this is it running Linux, by the way. It can run various Linux operating systems. And, and I should give credit to the V86 uh, person who makes this. He has a website where he actually shows many different use cases, such as Linux, running. And, and there's even network support as well that's using a WebSockets proxy. Um, 
But yeah, as far as making a standalone distribution or something like a, a progressive web app where you can install it, it's definitely possible, but uh, I haven't uh, explored those, those avenues yet. We have, uh, Andrew, thank you for your answer. And um, this is very cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is very cool. Uh, very impressive. So uh, thank you for coming to the show and explaining it. Uh, yeah, so not a problem. One thing I'm trying to convince people all the time is that, uh, you know, creating mixed reality experiences on the web. And uh, people, I think, worry about performance issues very much, but I think this is a really good app to show that it is possible to do a lot on the browser. Right, and and I think in a lot of ways, this still is a proof of concept. There's there's definitely apps where I'm not expecting people to go switch to using this as their, their work computer or something like that. But uh, I mean, if you imagine 10, 15 years from now, that was another pr thing where I talk about this website from 1999. That's 20 years ago, and it's it's still something that you can go and see and visit. So in 20 years, what will this be? Is this going to be in a museum, or or what will version 20 of this be, uh, is what I kind of think about it. Yeah, I'm curious to see the version. Uh, and you see <laughs> the, uh, how web changes all the time, too. It's fun mm -hmm. to look like. Yeah, like uh, but even like let's say for Safari, uh, I like I built this file system access API so that you can map drives. Like as an example here, you can actually go map directory, and I could map a local drive. Let's say my uh, you can't map. There are certain limitations to what you can map actually, but I can map let's say the drive that I had my other stuff in. So this file system access API, where you're actually directly talking to the file system on on my computer, that didn't even exist in Safari like a month ago or, or just a few months ago. And they've only just recently added that to just the, the, the latest version. So all the time I'm adding, I'm adding features that some of them are only in Chrome even right now, because I feel like they're kind of ahead in that, but uh, it, it just slowly but surely uh, gets in more browsers. That is very interesting. Um, yeah, I was surprised to hear that, you know, um, Safari gives access to the file system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so since it's a new release, like how did you know they were going to do this? Do you right. Their, um, release cycles? Uh, well, it was something they mentioned, I believe, too. It was, I think, it, I don't know if it was like version fifteen point four or fifteen three. It maybe was, but but also I do follow the file system access API spec, just because mm -hmm. for to work on this uh, my app here, there's actually another library called Browser FS, which is somewhat popular on GitHub, and they have different backends that you can create to communicate with, let's say Dropbox or the IndexedDB, like I'm using, and there wasn't one for the file system access API, so I've currently actually got a pull request out for the the backend that I've made that I'm using in my OS. And, and to do that, I kind of looked at the spec and the specs evolving all the time, actually, like even some of the commands are different between Safari and Chrome still. So if you want to look, read the file a certain way, it's, you have to look, oh no, it's this, it's this type of uh, object. So there's, it's still not easy from a developer point of view to just, uh, take, take a, an API, let's say a web API and just use it everywhere across every browser. Uh, yes. That's why we have the spec. Um, but <laughs> Uh, before it's published, we, there's always different um, implementations for testing purposes. And, uh, mm -hmm. So I have more questions about the um, uh, databases that you're using. But sure. We have question. Uh, what is minimal setup structure for dev environments for Vazi? That's a good question. I mean, uh, again, I would say I'm not a WASM expert, and I've been more on the utilizing point of view versus the actual porting of things or building them myself. Um, but but I, my understanding is it's evolving all the time, and it's actually it's actually pretty good at this point. Like, let's say if you made a Rust app, you you can basically target WebAssembly with with minimal effort. And there's a lot of there's tools like this M, M scripten library. I'm not sure if it's a library, a framework tool, whatever it happens to be. But typically, I've seen the the porting is done with this M scripten tool. And um, again, though, like the, I, you'll have to get me back in, in six months when I start doing some porting. But th there's been so much out there already where people have ported it. But there is a lot of interesting opportunities of li different lib, lib uh, like let's say this lib archive. There's a lot of other lib f uh, something out there in, in Linux libraries that could, could be ported. And I'm starting to see that a little bit with some of the WASM use cases where someone just took a lib and they've, they've essentially created like a little command line function, turned it into a website, and now it's a, it's a client-side app now. Yeah, it is um, quite amazing. And there are lots of lots of apps waiting to be converted already also. 
Yeah, definitely. And when you get these generic apps, like let's say this one here, I'm not sure how well this demo will go, but let, I have this app called Boxed Wine. It's another WebAssembly uh, demonstration that actually is running Wine, which is the, it's like an emulator in Linux called Wine is not an emulator, I think it stands for. I think it's one of those acronyms that's like, uh, goes around itself. Uh, but this person, this Boxed Wine, they've essentially made a Linux emulator just to run Wine so that they can run uh, 16 and 32-bit Windows applications. And you'll see here, it's doing a lot of fanciness in the console. It takes a bit of time to boot up, but there are executables such as Notepad++ that will actually run in the browser. So this, so if you had on Safari or on Linux or whatever it is, you could still go to my website, most likely, depending on what version of the browser you have, and you could just drag in an exe file, double click it, and it would open in boxed wine, hopefully, fingers crossed, and, and could be something like this, where, where this is a legitimate interactive program. I mean, it's obviously not very fast, but... Um, that kind of opens things up to, at some point, there won't even be this porting system necessarily. Maybe you just take an EXE and it just you just run it in the browser and, it, and it's nothing. So then someone, if you're on, let's say you're Safari, you're an Apple user, you download a Windows build and you could just run it in one of these little boxes or something like that. That would be ideal. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, speaking of, uh, what were the um, performance issues that you went into? Right. Well, I mean, just in general, I would say it's not getting the greatest frames per second. And, and if you like, let's say this boxed wine one, for example, I've talked to them on their GitHub issues page about some of the issues I had. And they basically said that the JavaScript, the, the M script and port in general is still a proof of concept. They have a, a desktop version of this uh, that they that they use as well. And I think that's the one that's a bit more performant. So I think the performance issues in general are just the fact that people haven't taken the work to optimize it at all. They've kind of just ported it over as a proof of concept and they're waiting for a use case to to start optimization work, I feel like. That is very common, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, that is uh, interesting. I, um, I, uh, I, I have one actually use case, I guess, just to get into some use cases and where performance is no longer an issue is let's say here's an example here for flash. So uh, I have some I have a few flash files and that's essentially been completely replaced now that flash has been removed from most browsers is anywhere where you're still going to find flash files. You're typically going to find it being ran by this uh, ruffle app. Uh, such as this Badger, Badger, Badger one. I, I don't have my audio, but if people remember are old enough to remember this Badger, Badger mushroom one. Um, so this is like a SWF, if people remember Adobe Flash. So, so this is something where it has been a use case where people have adopted it. I've seen this on, on, on many sites where they used to have Flash and now they've just embedded this Ruffle app. And from, from a performance point of view, it feels just as fast as how Flash felt back in the day. So this, this is one of those use cases where probably Ruffle five, ten years ago, whenever it came out, was a little laggy, and, and maybe Adobe Flash still existed, so there wasn't a reason to go to it. But slowly but surely, this, this WebAssembly use case has essentially been adopted, I would say. Uh, we have another question. Uh, sure. yeah, uh, what difference engine, web engines make doing WebKit, Gecko? Mm -hmm. um, Right. I don't have any performance metrics to say, to be honest. Um, I would say at least on, I mean, this is just going from my personal opinion, I guess, uh, on how my, my desktop app performs is I would say Chrome performs the best. Uh, I don't know if that's because I've designed for Chrome or if they have certain optimizations or what it happens to be. Uh, and then second, I've, I've actually found Safari is pretty performant when, when things work, when it can support the apps and uh, when I don't have to do a bunch of tweaks to get it to work, it, it's been pretty good. And, and I found Firefox is to be the, the lesser, uh, of those three, I guess, as the three main ones that I've tested on. And I'm not sure what that is. Maybe that's another optimization thing where maybe they haven't focused as much on WebAssembly optimizations, or maybe the people who made these ports focused also built it with Chrome in mind and, and optimized for that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little tricky and yeah, it gets with these web engines, it just gets back to the people optimizing for, for their, their use cases, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, question. How this app was developed? Did you use React? Um, yeah, definitely. I used a Next.js framework and built oh. it with React and TypeScript. Did you say Next.js? Next.js. Next.js, okay. Yeah, yeah, Next.js um, framework. And it's it's been really nice just because it kind of had a lot of the, the stuff already included. And then you can kind of customize it as you go, as you kind of build, let's say. So I didn't have to, like, I do know a bit about Webpack and everything like that, but I, I'm not one of those developers that enjoys necessarily every little bit of a configuration. So I appreciated what Next.js gave me where you kind of already have a little bit of structure. Uh, and then from there, I've used TypeScript because I'm a, I'm a big proponent of TypeScript and, uh, and trying to type 
as tight as possible. There's no any's in, in my, my code or anything like that. And, uh, and linting as well is another thing that's been pretty important to me with my ESLint rules are like, are, v are very strict so that, uh, just try to keep the code as clean as possible. That was another actually, uh, important part of doing the side project was to try to learn how to keep improving the code and iterate on it. And, and to keep it, and like, I knew it was going to get big, but I need, I needed it to stay manageable because I'd actually done a previous version and it was basically unmanageable to the point where I, I needed to make another one. Oh, wow. Is the production app that you're working on bigger or your app is bigger now? <laughs> mm, yeah, that's hard. I guess that my app is definitely bigger if you consider all the ports and, and the lib library files that I've kind of dragged along with me. Um, yeah, probably in general, mine is bigger, to be honest, uh, than, than most of the things I've worked on. I, I'd say most of the time, in general, my experience at, at jobs has been making simple, simple front end apps to kind of just interact with lists and dialogues and that kind of thing and they're not typically going into extracting icons from executable binary files and uh, running uh, x86 linux environments and that kind of thing yeah, sounds like you're having more fun after hours yeah it's uh not a, not a knock against work it's just i guess uh, passion projects is just the way they go i suppose yeah um next is um fairly new so can you explain uh, what that is and um uh, the other thing before I forget, I wanted to just ask you, you said you keep improving. Uh, what were the architectural changes that, you know, you start uh, making after, you know, you got more experience? Right. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me think back on that. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I guess architecturally, the, the biggest problem I had with it at the start was that I didn't go in with a big, a big enough vision of what it could be or what it was going to be. So there were too many things that were artificial about it, like like some of the way the file system was set up or some of the way the windows work. And that's something I'd seen with a lot of these desktop environments. There's not a lot of them out there, to be honest, but they used to be more popular, like I guess 10 years ago, there's a lot of jQuery versions. And nowadays there's a few examples, there's like os.js and I've seen a few of them out there, but but that was the problem that I, I fell into was parts of it, you go, oh, I'll just fake that part, you know, just to, I, I just want the look. And I decided with this one to not do that and to, to kind of, uh, if you see all these post-its behind me, these are times where I ran into a wall essentially and I, I couldn't figure out how to do it, but I didn't take the easy way out. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll put it on the board. And I guess that's just been the biggest thing. I, f I feel like that happens a lot of time in code where, where you, you, know you know you're not necessarily doing it the best way, but you're just trying to get to the next step. And I've tried to, to curb that on this project because I, I just, it's, it always gets the code out of hand eventually. That's true. And um, yeah. It's hard to see too. Like sometimes I think that, oh, I, I wrote this really clean code. And then uh, a year later you look at it and I'm like, oh, no, this is not good at all. Yeah. But yeah, I love adding things to it all the time and I'm starting to do more machine learning things. And it's it's an opportunity to kind of get into the into different tech. Like let's say for web three things, I've been thinking how how could I have a distributed file system? And I've started to get to learn about IPFS and and how that, that piece could be connected. Because that's I guess since I posted it, that's one thing that people have been interested in is I want to be able to keep files on it and, and see them somewhere else. Because it, you can keep it locally, but it's saved within the browser. So there is this whole distributed file system idea. Uh, and and then then just trying to get into different machine learning parts. Like I added this new live wallpaper the other day. That this was actually on Hacker News just recently. This Hexelis, mm -hmm. which is actually using uh, neural network models to. Uh, it's from the same person who did uh, Deep Dream. If you know the Deep Dream, where they make those pictures where it kind of exaggerates features. And mm -hmm. this is kind of like a pattern matching wallpaper. So it, it's just another. Op this one I don't think is using WebAssembly, but it's another opportunity to learn uh, new web APIs. Uh, like I was able to take this and move it into an off-screen canvas that it, again is running in one of these web workers. So it's it's a way to get it off of the main thread so that when I do run something heavy like WebAssembly or let's say like this boxed wine, you see the wallpaper is not, uh, it's, there's no shifting at all. Whereas before this, it couldn't handle that at all. So this is where, where essentially we have a, a form of like a multi-threading now, basically yeah. within the browser. Yeah, you kind of explained it, but I'm going to ask you, um, what is web workers? And, um, sure. I a few other questions coming up too. Sure. So as you can see here, some of the workers that happen to be running here on these threads here. So the main thread is typically what you would have in the browser. If you open up a normal website that's not using workers, I don't even know if you have this tab and it would just be the main thread is what you have. Uh, but these other threads are essentially separate contexts that can run uh, can run a, essentially a separate process. And it doesn't have to it doesn't have to wait for the main thread to do things like 
uh, check if the mouse is moving or check if drawing is occurring, that kind of thing. So these things are able to run independently. So let's say the wallpaper here, that's running an independent thread. The clock, I've actually moved into an independent thread for, for whatever reason. Uh, and then there's the main thread. And then there's a few things here. Like this, I think, is coming from Monaco. This isn't even one of mine. But this is where when you start utilizing these different libraries, you see that these uh, there's these workers all over the place kind of that are whenever you load up files. Cool. Uh we talked about uh, WebRTC in, in the last episode to check it out if you uh, haven't seen it in the context of WebXR. Cool. So, Laser is the first thing that comes to my mind. WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. Laser. Yeah, definitely. I've uh, I've have seen it a bit. I don't know if any of the Wasm stuff I'm using is has utilized it or anything. Uh, I am looking into the idea of having a C sharp interpreter using Blazor. I, I've seen there there's some work being done for that, where that would be a WebAssembly use case, because uh, I do have a few cases like that. Like I have here, if you see this Python file here that I just dragged onto my desktop, that's actually, I have a Python interpreter that's running in WebAssembly. So you see here, that was running, that's running in Python. And I wanted to have a C Sharp one as well. And, and I'd seen that there was one running and I think that was using Blazor. But as, as, a, as using it to do building of WebAssembly, I, I, I don't personally have any experience with that. What is Blazor exactly? Well, because I don't have any experience with it, I'm not going to be the best person to to speak on it. But uh, my understanding was it's it's like a a Microsoft uh, version uh, of kind of moving to to the browser to have WebAssembly, and mm -hmm. I think it's like a framework for their version of WebAssembly, utilizing WebAssembly. But please don't quote me on that because, that, like I say, that, that that's not one where I've dug too much into. And and even in general, WebAssembly, like I think there's there's definitely two avenues to it. There's the, the utilizers, the people that are using these ports, and then there's the people that are are making the ports. Those are those are the two big differences, I would say. And right now, I, I'm on the more in the utilization side. That's a good side to be on too. <laughs> uh, Prashish asked uh, my next question: uh, What security checks features Wasm uh, Dev Community is implementing? Is it sandbox? Mm -hmm. And please also explain what sandbox is. Sure. So I mean, I guess yeah, they're asking about how, if it's been. Uh, what kind of level of security isolation it has, uh, what ability it has to interact with other things in the browser, other things on the website, maybe, um, that kind of thing. I, I mean, that gets into into a whole can of worms. Uh, and I would say there is a lot of consideration being made to that. My understanding is it's, it's on a per browser level, I guess, a, a bit of it, how, as far as the implementation and how, how the how, let's say, WebKit or, or Chromium wants to, to isolate that. But but the basics of it is that it, yes it is somewhat sandboxed and there is some level of safety there and let's say with WebAssembly with the x86 or let's say with that boxed wine when when we open up the uh, there's a way to open up here browse here so this file system I believe is, is like a, something called like this M script and file system so it's not directly able to interact with this external file system or or the other level one level further back file system as far as I understand it is that there's this sandbox. There's like this intermediary API layer essentially between most interactions, which even makes it to the point where you can't even interact with the canvas and you have to write JavaScript to detect the clicks and then kind of send them along as messages. But that being said, I'm, I'm sure one day we'll find out that there was a, a zero day and that it's been vulnerable for 10 years. You know, I mean, I feel like that's how it is with the, with the internet and just security in general is that there, there's these things out there that, that, you don't know it until you know it, and then it turns out, oh, you know, there was a vulnerability there. Yeah, that is a uh, much better uh, impact, much better than, um, you know, say for any hardware, Android, iOS. Well, iOS is pretty good as well, because uh, we do implement so W3C, we have the spec, and uh, we do make sure that it's secure. And that's why everything improves much slower on the web as well, because we want to make sure. Uh, I think you've mentioned index DB as well. Um, can you tell us how are you using it and what are the limitations of it? Sure, definitely. So yeah, I am using index DB as, uh, as the main file system. And like I said, that's coming from this uh, browser FS project. Um, 
they have various different backends. Here in the DevTools application tab, you can kind of look at the different storages uh, options. So I'm not doing many of them. Like I I'm not doing any low, well, I'm not sure that, that might get created by one of the programs. That's another thing too, when you have all these different libs like I do that you're loading and allowing them to kind of get jump into the window object is you leave yourself open for, for the fact that they add little things here and there possibly. Uh, in this case, they haven't added cookies, but I don't know what that where that came from. Uh, and I don't do anything in the session, but you'll see here in the index DB that we have a few different, uh, f um, I guess you'd call these file systems or databases, I would say. Uh, and the browser FS one being the main one. Um, I, I let them, I let browser FS handle most of this because there's already an existing backend for this, but basically what it does on the developer side of it from the, from a library user that's using browser FS is that I'm able to use the, for people that might be familiar with Node.js's FS, the file system, uh, object essentially to access the file system, fs.read file, fs.write file, that kind of thing. Essentially that's what this does is browser FS makes it so that when you're writing the JavaScript, you can act as if there is an FS in the browser, and then you can set up the backend to say, when I say write file, I want that to go to index DB. And when I say read file, I want it to, in this case, it, it actually, you can create a JSON object that's essentially like a, a reference to where the files are on, on the web server. So that when you do a read file, it actually ends up doing an HTTP request. But then let's say once you've written to it that, and it knows that, then the next time it'll read it from the index DB because then it'll be like a dynamic file. So, so with that, I'm able to, let's say with my blog posts here, I can let people look at my blog posts and then they can switch to design mode and just delete a bunch of parts of it, save that, close it. And then when they come back to the site, they can see those changes and see that it's been changed because now it's, it's based on the index DB file instead of reading it via an HTTP get request. So that's part of it anyways. I mean, there, there is a lot more to IndexedDB. As far as let's let's get into the limitations like you were saying, it actually doesn't have, I mean, it has limitations obviously, but uh, as far as from a storage limit for Chrome, it, there is quite a bit of storage you can you can use it on it. I think like 200, uh, or it's some, it's some percentage of, of your hard drive, I believe. So I think in my, my personal computer case, it's over 100 gigabytes or something like that. Uh, and the IndexedDBs, you can, the, the, in this case, it's being used like a file system, but it's a, it's a database, uh, which I guess is a, could be considered a kind of file system, let's say. So I'm also, I have another one here called the, this KeyVal store, which is another library that I'm using. And this is just to keep track of uh, file handles for the, the file system access API. Because if I, let's say if here, if I map a, a directory where I share a local drive, you can actually retain the, that handle. So if I refresh the page and I come back, it'll actually remember that that share and that's that's also being stored in the index DB. So it has it's it can be useful for storing other other things like these file handles. I feel like index DB is one of those uh, uh, APIs that is underutilized. Not many people know that it exists. Yeah, well, I can see why though. Like, let's say this key val that I'm using here, where I grab something from npm, it's actually hard to interact with index DB. If you just want to use the normal commands, they, it's not exa it's not just write read. Uh, and, and if you go to MDN in the articles, there'll be several like helper libraries because the API is is not intuitive. I would say. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's hard to make the API intuitive <laughs> sometimes. Um, so using WebAssembly, is it possible to make Mori run on web browser? Uh, as far as I know, Mari is an island in Hawaii, but uh, <laughs> that was that was what I was thinking too. Yeah, I would. You definitely can't run an island in the web browser. I would say, um, if you could clarify what Maui is, but yeah, I'm not familiar with that one either. But but my mentality on that, without even knowing what it is, I would say yes, you can run it on the web browser. <laughs> That's definitely my mentality of my project, and uh, I pretty much never say no to that. And it's it's just a matter of time, you know. Like if it can't run yet, it's just because we haven't ported the right piece yet. Uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, no, just you know, please explain um, what Maui is, and so uh, we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, yeah. So looking back, like you've been working on this for a long time. What kind of um, uh, advice would you give back to yourself? Uh, two years back, maybe at the very beginning. Sure. Well, hmm, that's a tough one. I mean, I wouldn't say it's tough. I've, I've definitely learned a lot along the way. Many of these techniques and things with CSS, I, I would almost tell myself to just keep doing it. You know, like it's, it's, I think it's been rewarding and the, it's the detail work. I think that's, that's what I've noticed. It's the things like, let's say here, when you hover over the terminal here, how there's a little peak window there, or I can hover here and, and you get this, uh, the peak, you know, that kind of, that little aspect there, that that's like a month of, of little things. 
So and just learning, it's just the ability to be able to capture it and make an image of it here and and all the different animations along the way to, to make it happen. So the the detail work I would say is what's important. I noticed that a lot of people kind of skip that in, in the side projects or when they want to make a clone of something, it's like, it's kind of good enough, but it's, it's once you actually, once you kind of get into the details where that's where you really learn, I find. Yeah. It's almost impossible to not get better at something if you're doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. We have found out what Maui is. Maui is the next version of Xamarin forms, uh, the .NET framework for developing cross platform, uh, mm -hmm. mobile apps. Well, uh, yeah. So I, I would say I don't have any technical say if that that is uh, if that's on the way or anything or in the works within the, the Zarman Forms group. But uh, in general, I, ha I have seen a transition with WebAssembly where people are trying to make things like that work, like uh, different windowing systems. I'm trying to think of the name of one right now. Um, it, it's like a variation on X, X windows. It's like, like the, the protocol for doing it, but darned if I could remember the name of it. But anyways, people are starting to think at that level where, and that is, that is kind of the level that I'm thinking if I, if I were to make another version of this operating system is maybe even, like right now, remember how I said there's that canvas for, let's say in the X86 emulator is why not just take that canvas and just move it into the entire screen. So the whole thing is a canvas. And then now you're just building in WebAssembly. And, and then, and then I almost wonder if the sky's the limit. Essentially, you just go to a site and it's just all canvas, which, which I think is there's some use cases where people are almost moving in that direction. I think Fig, Figma is one of them, where, where a good chunk of the uh, parts of what they do are, are you're just looking at WebAssembly. But, it, I mean, it's it's essentially seamless at this point. So it's hard to know when you're looking at WebAssembly and when you're not now. This uh, interesting. So, um, Forms is also <laughs> not the most popular uh, web API uh, as well. How did you get into get into it? For which API? Sorry. Um, Canvas, like. Ah, for. Uh, right. Well, I mean, I think it's just uh, a necessity. I would say of this WebAssembly world, as I think that that's kind of the window that, uh, at least what I've seen in most of these. Sorry. Sorry, Dawson. Um, your uh, microphone is squeaking. I guess. Oh, is it? Maybe my chair. I'll stop shaking. Am I less squeaky now? I don't want to give you any feedback, but if you hear any more, I'll, I'll try to stand. Ah, okay, yeah, I'll try to be less squeaky. Sorry, what was the question again? Um, wait, I don't forget. Okay, how do you get into the canvas? <laughs> right, yeah. No, again, um, I'd say it's. it seems like it's a necessary evil, is what I've seen, at least in a lot of these ports where people, where you need to have the interaction, or even without the interaction, really. The canvas is kind of like the window into the into the DOM from, from WebAssembly's point of view. Yeah, um, this is a discussion uh, that we have all the time. So I never introduced myself, actually. I'm a cloud developer advocate um, at Microsoft, but I'm also co-chairing uh, Immersive Web at W3C. So one of, um, one of the limitations of WebXR we found that, you know, uh, web developers are not super comfort comfortable with Canvas, so uh, is should we make everything like A-Frame, if you ever heard of it, uh, like a new HTML elements to do WebXR, or uh, how do we make it easy? But it doesn't look like you are afraid of going into any. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, like you say, I, I didn't I didn't know that you had that background. That's very interesting. And uh, I would be happy if things went in that direction. I don't, uh, I don't want this fake canvas where essentially I'm just clicking a picture and then I have to do some magic in the background to kind of make, turn that click into what I wanted to click at that fake thing somewhere else. It would be great if, if uh, just, I would love if WebAssembly could just access the DOM in general. I think that gets into the sandboxing question and from a security point of view, there's probably a lot of issues there, but that would be my ideal would be to just to, to be able to work with the elements. And then maybe at that point, there could be something like, uh, like there's this React 3JS or, mm -hmm. or different React libraries where I could, where WebAssembly could become another building block on the DOM. And you could start just to putting things in web workers or now this, this piece is WebAssembly and these elements are WebAssembly, maybe like a, almost like a web component that's a WebAssembly thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, I, I guess I don't know. I, I'm just kind of spitballing ideas, but, but you know, I, I wouldn't say I am comfortable with the canvas, I guess. If you give me an alternative, I'll take it, honestly. <laughs> that, that's a very good point. Uh, I think we will give you an alternative. Uh, so it's in the works. And for anyone who's interested, uh, all of the uh, WPC work happens uh, on GitHub, basically. And, you know, if you ask for it, we'll prior, prioritize it. 
but yeah, Apple is very interested in the model we were in. So that's one of the things that we uh, put up on our schedule for the next year. Oh, great. As, uh, did you, were you always a web developer, Dustin? No, definitely not. I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by that. I would say, I've always been a web developer in spirit, let's say. Uh, I mean, since since I was, like I say, even nine years old and making my website, that, that was where I kind of got into programming was once I learned about ViewSource and, and about HTML and basically just HTML at that point. I didn't really know about the JavaScript or CSS side for I don't even know how much longer. I'm, I mean, I, I did to a very small degree, but I almost didn't even understand there was a division or that kind of thing. Um, but no, I, um, out of, out of high school, I, I went into it and I was doing it for about six or seven years where I was, uh, mm -hmm. mostly just fixing computers, doing networking, going to different companies and setting up whatever they want. I mean, I was always a person in the family that was, uh, I'm always, a, I was the friend of computers, you know, I was always into it. So mm -hmm. people fixing printers, uh, whatever, whatever you needed, I was always that person. And I knew that was going to be my career, but I think going out of high school, I, I wasn't sure if I, I wanted to go the degree route. So I think that's where I got into IT before I finally uh, shifted gears when I moved to British Columbia in Canada. And I decided, you know, I want to focus more on software. And, and it's, it's been about seven years of that now. And, and now I've been at Microsoft for about five months now. Oh, five months. You're, yeah, that's unique for Microsoft, especially. Yeah, yeah, it is just in de December, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it has a clarification question, I guess. So Basin Foldable Binary Code is an executable program and the browser is the host. That sounds like a accurate clarification. Mm -hmm. so yeah, if I, I, if I didn't say it that way, that, that sounds better. I, I like that explanation better. But yeah, that is the way I thought of it. And that's where I say where I, I hope one, I mean, that's what I've tried to make with my site actually is where you take an EXE, drag it on, you get the icon, you double click it, it opens. That's that's what I want, but I wanted I wanted Wasm to be like that when I first found out about it a couple of years ago, where I thought, oh, dot Wasm, like you just import it, just like you'd import a, another file, and it's we're not quite there yet. There's there's still a lot of glue in between, but but in, but in the end, I would say it is it is basically that like a portable binary code that executes with the browser as the host. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, summarization is always helpful, <laughs> and iteration, <laughs> right. description. Here's another example here. There's just so many of them out there. This is like a, the Super Nintendo, Nintendo, and Genesis emulator. And this is a free ROM. This is a, this is one that's been created by somebody as like an open source one, like a classic Kong. I think it's like a copy of Donkey Kong. But uh, I mean, the use cases are, are, are big for it, really. I mean, there's so many apps out there like uh, for games and stuff. And if we could just play these these old games or or you could start a new open source community, kind of. I mean, there's all these, there's so many, like this game, Classic Kong, for the Super Nintendo, who, who would have any reason to play this? And I mean, if you had a Super Nintendo, you couldn't play this game because I don't even know how you would get it in the Super Nintendo. But now there's this opportunity for people that have made these things, perhaps for this to become a, a web platform, let's say, without them having to go through all, all the work of porting. I mean, I think it would be import, impossible for them to port the Super Nintendo game to, to, like, to the browser any other way than something like this. Yeah, this is really cool. Um, we have a lot of people watching. Hi, everyone. And uh, please keep your questions coming. We have uh, around 10 -ish minutes. And uh, this is your chance to ask away to Dustin. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was going to ask you, um, how was the learning curve uh, working with uh, WebAssembly? How did you get started? Where did you learn? What are good resources basically? Sure. Um, well, as, as someone utilizing libraries, I would say the resources uh, are sparse uh, for a lot of these ports. Um, a lot of the ones that I've used, it's it, they're like proof of concept, like they're desktop apps where they've made an mscript and build or or someone just kind of got it running. So in those cases, it's, it's going to be a little harder to, to figure out how they got it going and how they've, they've, they've made some kind of JS file, they've made some kind of WASM file. It works on their demo.html file. How can you get it to work on your website for, for what you want it to do? That can be hard, and I don't know if there's any guides for that because that's those are those ports are ones that people made. So that's that's where I, I sometimes do get into the thing where I want to do my own ports. Like I saw there was there's a port of uh, Vim dot Vim, you know, like the Vim the editor, mm -hmm. uh, but but it had some some issues that basically made it un, unusable for me and it hadn't been managed. So so that's kind of one of the challenges that I'm interested in is, is porting something like that. Um, but but as someone getting started, I. <sighs> It's hard to say. It really depends. If you want to utilize these libraries, I guess you'd have to kind of look through them. Like, there's some really good websites. Uh, what is it? Made Made with WebAssembly, I think, is one of them. 
I, I don't have any of them in front of me, unfortunately. But if you if you just look on on online, there's actually a lot of WebAssembly awesome. Wasm is another one, another GitHub list, where it's got hundreds of different projects. Uh, but but yeah, that isn't an issue. I would say. I guess there's one example, Wapm.io, and that gets into this other thing I could discuss here involving the terminal. Is is Wapm.io is is run by I can't remember the group that runs it, but this is like a, almost like npm for WebAssembly. It's like a package manager. And essentially it has some packages where people have made these WASMs and made them work within the, the WASM system. And on their website here, they actually have uh, a way to run these things as well. So you can do this open in a shell. And they this basically this console is something I'm working on getting a better version of. I have a version of it here. So let's say I have, the only one that I can do is Kausei. So Kausei is running in a WASM and I've got it so I can say hi. Um, but most of the other are ones that require back and forth. Let's say there's another one called QJS, which is like a quick JS. I don't even know what the input is for it, but it didn't work anyways. It looks like it failed because uh, it tried to get the WASM file, but it's missing. So this is again where th that's a repository issue, it looks like. Uh, it's still early days in the WASM community. So, th so there are these resources out here, but but certain things stop working or they've changed this. This has actually changed quite a bit since the last time I looked at it. It looks like they've actually evolved it quite a bit, but this would be a good place to start, I would say. You can explore the packages and see what some of the people are making. There's not a lot of use cases here, but at least it can get you into the idea of, of you just press that button and, and there you've got some WebAssembly right there. You can kind of see how some of the things are built and these typically connect to open source projects where you can see how they've been built, uh, so, such as this one here. So that would be, I guess, a suggestion for, for how to get started, but it, it's it's going to be very specific to your use case, I think, because it's it's like uh, it's it's just a tool, I suppose, is, is my point there. Um, I remember looking looking at WebAssembly six seven years ago or something, and um, I didn't find much at the time, and uh, I just gave up. So kudos to you for <laughs> continuing. And also, it looks like uh, the ecosystem evolved as well. There's lots of uh, options there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's evolving all the time, I would say. Like that WAPM.io is, is a good example where they're trying to build an ecosystem. And I think Wasimer is, is another one uh, where I, th I think they have make a website, WebAssembly.sh, I think it is. Oops, I have a thing going to my console every time. WebAssembly.sh, I believe it is. Well, I don't want to mistype it here on, on live because who knows what URL you'll get me to. But there's so many resources out there. But but yeah, it's the community is is still coming along. And I'm not really sure who the champion is at the moment for, for the WebAssembly community. Yeah, uh, what are the best exa I mean, examples of things that uh, you can do? Like, what would you like uh, to be on the web? What kind of applications? Mm -hmm. As far as things that are, are still missing, right? Um, well, one example I'm gonna give you is the design tools, like um, Maya is one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or Adobe products. Yeah, there was an article just recently about Adobe moving to the web, and I think that's a big transition. I think uh, I'm not sure if they had a product that was Figma was competing with, but I know at some point Figma became the thing, and, and designers would always send me Figma links, and I know that that's a lot of WebAssembly, and they've I think they've managed to make a product that was performant in the browser and still had a lot of features that typically you wouldn't think of in the browser necessarily, or, or you'd think this is like an Adobe program that you run. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I think I, that's the transition I'm I'm seeing in general, and uh, I I almost don't I don't hope for more of it just because I feel like it, it is all coming. You know, I'm not I, I I think the spotlight is here, I guess, for WebAssembly. Yeah. Okay. My question was also to figure out like uh, at which point do you think a developer set should say, oh, okay, I need WebAssembly, and I shouldn't be just doing it with regular right. JavaScript. Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're doing more than a, than a simple site, I would say, if you have some kind of advanced use case, I would, I would say it could be an early on consideration. Definitely. If, if performance, if you want to make a, a little piece of logic more optimal, I would say it can be good for that. Uh, or if you want to build something new, like you want to make an image converter or you want to make something that's in one of those in the browser. Now, now it's in the browser. Definitely. Uh, I think WebAssembly is going to be your friend there, but it's it's not. I wouldn't say necessarily everybody should just start building their websites in WebAssembly. And oh, you need to put you don't have any WebAssembly in your site. Oh, it's no good then. You know, um, it's not like that. It's it's still a special use case, and typically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is going to get you pretty far, anyways. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So you don't have to over optimize for um, anything. Uh, so my question is, how come you or have you tried to convince your team to? 
use WebAssembly. Uh, yeah, I haven't yet. I, I'd like to find some use cases, definitely. I actually think I thought of one the other day where we had a video player and there's and it's like there was a there's a limit to what formats you can play like this happens all the time any you want to upload a profile photo oh we take jpeg and png okay what well, i have a bitmap you know and and that's that's a use case for wasm essentially like uh, these are two tools i have in my my thing right now and uh, it, like if you have images let's say here's an example of my my brain scan if you right click this here convert to i've i've actually in in got web uh, image magic using WebAssembly. You can see here it ran there and it converted it. So now it's converted to a bitmap. So that's the kind of thing that could happen in the background uh, for a web website. If you want to just offer, just give us any image and I'll run it through image magic or just give me any video and I'll run it through FFmpeg, which is another one I have on here for converting videos and audio. So essentially we, we get rid of that whole, oh, it has to be this file type. And now it's just the, the brow your browser will, will fix it if necessary. It'll just lazy load the library and change the binary and then it'll send it to the server and it'll be your cpu cycles mm -hmm. 18 process heavy basically right yeah i mean it's a little process heavy and then you also just save the server time too of sending a bitmap file to the server or just not even giving the option to the user which is the typical thing to do mm -hmm. and uh, you know there's always a chance of uh, failure if you send it the data to somewhere else and it's more secure uh yeah there's lots of yeah, from a security point of view, I think that's a huge one is, is running less or sending less things to servers and running more things client side is a, is a is things people like, I think, in general. Yeah, uh, it is important. So um, we have five minutes left, but um, what is the next thing that you're going to add to your project? Where are you looking hmm. to? Well, I got a big uh, list of post-its there. That's a, kind of my, my organization system, the post-its, things to do, and then I move them over there when they're done. Uh, as far as big, big next things, I guess it is, I'm trying to figure out a use for web three, I think like everybody else. Um, I mean, I don't know if everyone else is, but I just, I keep hearing about it. And I think, you know, there, there are opportunities. I, I think web three is still like web assembly where it doesn't have a lot of use cases uh, necessarily, or, to, or it's, it's got, mm -hmm. it can be used in a lot of things, but it's, lo it's looking for someone to use it in some way. So that's where I want to do something like a distributed file system or some, some kind of d distributed part, because I, I like the idea of things running in the browser, me not needing a server, but I want to take it to the next level. I want to have it peer to peer or I want to ha or this distributed system, you know, and, and kind of, and, and uh, get into a blockchain type of thing. And that's actually where I was looking into this. I mean, this gets into a whole other rant, but Filecoin is, is where the, I guess that's where I'm looking into is just the whole idea of using these, uh, having another use for these cryptocurrencies that's actually have as a value just because I've seen this file coin as a system of, of like a distributed file system where there's actually a value in calculating the hashes or, or to calculate the next uh, block in the chain. It's not just arbitrary math. It's like actually useful. So I, I want to do something useful, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully we won't destroy the earth while doing that. Right. Uh, has a great question. Uh, last so I don't want to miss that. If the basin is a binary, how does it compile or package? And what debugger do you use uh, to look into the binary instruction? Right. Um, yeah, so I mean, it compiles, it packages to that .wasm file. Uh, and it's loaded, typically the JavaScript file is loaded in binary format. And then there's like a, a WebAssembly initialization process that's done in the JavaScript side. Uh, as far as debugging it, there is a debugger. I've seen some articles. I've tried to do it myself but because i've been more on the porting side of things i haven't gotten too deep into it just because uh e even if i did figure out what it is okay now i need to go clone their repo change the thing get their build working just so that i can make this dot wasm file which is an unfortunate issue with wasm versus javascript where when you have a dot js file you can go edit it right there but the wasm file you kind of have to go back to the original and do the whole build over again um but there, there I, I don't have a good example of where to debug it or how exactly just because i haven't done it too much, but DevTools uh, does have a system for, for for digging into the for where you can actually set breakpoints at, at the WebAssembly level and see see a little bit into the code. But I, I think it's it's not uh, it's not the same as like having a full on source map and debugging to that degree, as far as I know. Uh, does VS Code has um, any support? I, yeah, I don't want to speak out of turn. I would say I don't know. That's that's where I need to get more into the debugging side of things. Uh, for, from a utilization point of view, I think if you're using these libraries that it's someone else has ported and you have a problem that's on the WebAssembly side, you, you're probably in trouble. If, if you're, I mean, if you're debugging, you're, you, like I said, there's still all those other steps. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a tricky one at this point. That's still early stages. Uh, 
Cool. We have less than one minute. Justin, how can people ask you more questions? How can they do that here? Sure. Um, good question. I'm on Twitter, I guess. Dustin Brett on Twitter. Um, my website, DustinBrett.com. Uh, you can visit me on there. There's not a lot of ways to reach out to me, I guess. I should be more accessible, perhaps. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm on GitHub. You can post on the Daedalus. Uh, the, the, this project is called Daedalus, and uh, it's on my GitHub repository, and you can post anything on there, issues, discussions, that kind of thing. There's a whole discussion forum there, and I, I'm very active on there. Yeah, and comment on uh, below, and there's a link to um, Dustin's blog post uh, down in the description. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It was uh, such a great conversation. Thanks, Dustin, for sharing this. And uh, this is amazing work. Thank you. I had a great time sharing it.